Welcome to Baptist Medical News Network. I'm Rhonda McRae. Thank you for joining us for our live webcast today. We're talking about the good news about cancer in Mississippi and helping us today is Dr. Justin Baker. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for we having appreciate me. it. Appreciate it. Um, well, just a few housekeeping rules before we get started and then we'll jump into what we're talking about. First of all, you can post questions for Dr. Baker right on our website right on the page where you're viewing, but if you happen to be somewhere else, it's www.mbhs.org slash mednewslive. You can post questions starting right now. We'll get to them later after we uh, go through our material. We'll check those later. If we don't have any questions, we'll, we'll conclude, but go ahead and start posting your questions now. Secondly, as you're watching this webcast, you may see some advertising from uh, scrolling across the bottom of the screen, and that is not advertising paid to Baptist, that is paid to Ustream TV that makes this live streaming capability possible, so just note that. And then third, after today's webcast is over, we're going to put a recorded version of this webcast on our website, so if you think someone that you know could benefit from watching this, check back on our website for the recorded version. We'll have it archived probably later today, could be tomorrow, but check back. And the page to view the recorded version would be www.mbhs.org slash mednewslive and um, that will uh, give you a link to today's recorded version. So with all that underway, let's, let's go ahead and get started, Dr. Baker. First all of right. all, the three, we're talking about the three most commonly diagnosed cancers in Mississippi. So let's identify those to get started. What are those? Lung, breast, and prostate okay. are the most common in Mississippi. Okay. Not only in Mississippi, but also in the United States. Okay, all right. And so we've talked about for each one of those three, there's mm -hmm. there's good news about them. So That's give right. us the good news. Everybody wants good news about cancer. Well, that is good. The good news about these are they're all preventable and they're, and they're also uh, potentially detectable earlier using screening modalities. Okay. All right. Well, good. So we're not necessarily a victim of these. They're things that we can do. That's right. Okay. Well, let's then break it down, take them one at a time. Why don't we start with lung cancer and tell us uh, the good news about lung cancer. Well, lung cancer is the, is the number one can ki cancer killer in America. Uh, there's uh, approximately 200,000 uh, cases uh, a year in, in the United States that are diagnosed. But the, the, the main thing about lung cancer is that it is preventable. Preventable. The, the best way to prevent lung cancer is to stop smoking. Okay. So that leads to this question. What, how many cases of lung cancer can you trace back to some kind of tobacco right. relation? Well, 90% uh, or 9 out of 10 patients who come in to see us with lung cancer have a history of smoking cigarettes. Um, and of course, there are other risk factors associated okay. with lung cancer too, but uh, smoking uh, cigarettes is the number one cause for lung cancer. Just cigarettes, or does that include like pipes? Does it include cigars? And what about, for example, like chewing tobacco? Well, by, the majority of patients have smoked cigarettes, okay. but obviously smoking cigars and uh, pipes and things like that are also risk factors. Uh, even smoking marijuana has been associated with mm -hmm. uh, lung cancer, but secondhand smoke the, is associated with lung cancer. Uh, Surgeon General in 2006 came out and said, mm -hmm. hey, uh, secondhand smoke is associated with uh, lung cancer. The risk is not as high as a, as a person who smokes cigarette, mm -hmm. but the risk of secondhand smoke can be cumulative over a lifetime. Um, as far as uh, smokeless tobacco or other forms of tobacco, there's really no safe form of tobacco available. Uh, these to uh, uh, smokeless tobacco or chewing tobacco mm -hmm. stuff can be associated with other cancers mm -hmm. like head and neck cancer. Okay, all right. So the message for lung cancer is if you don't smoke, you reduce your risk of lung cancer really astronomically. Well, you're right, because a person who smokes, say, has a 40-pack year history of smoking, uh, smokes one pack a day for 40 years, they have a, a risk that's 20 times 
a person who's never smoked, and that's pretty significant. And if you stop smoking, the risk never quite goes back down to the normal population, but it does get close. Okay, so uh, over time, you anticipated the question: if a person has that might be watching this right now has smoked their whole life, will quitting help them? Yes. Okay. All right. Easily, yes. Okay. And even some recent uh, evidence has that I, uh, by the NCCN has come out, even in patients who have lung cancer who are undergoing therapy, if they stop smoking, they actually, or they respond better, they tolerate treatment a lot better. Okay. So there's even advantages for patients who are diagnosed with lung cancer okay. to stop smoking. Okay. And let's talk a little bit more about the exposure to secondhand smoke. If you, you know, you, if you are smoking, you're not only putting yourself at risk, you said there's a lifetime cumulative effect for a person who has secondhand Exactly. Exposure. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know there are other uh, there are other thing other risk factors for uh, uh, for lung cancer too. Other exposures, but a lot of times we find that these are synergistic with cigarette smoking. For instance, a, a woman who's had breast cancer and had radiation for for a breast cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, she, because she's had breast cancer and she smokes, she's at higher risk uh, for lung cancer. And also, there's always the question of asbestos. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, my daddy had lung cancer, he was exposed to asbestos. But most of the time, those patients have smoked cigarettes. Uh, so there's a, the synergy between those, mm -hmm. those type things. Okay. So our message is, don't smoke. <laughs> or if you do smoke, quit. It will help you. But that's the good news about lung cancer. There, I mean, there are there are uh, modalities available to help you with smoking cessation, and probably the best way or the most proven way to uh, stop smoking is a combined approach. As far as having the support group mm -hmm. or the accountability type partner, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be in a group session or, and also pharmacotherapy, because medication the, medications because uh, the biggest uh, barrier to stopping smoking is. Nicotine, mm -hmm. you know that it can people become dependent on it, they become tolerant of it, and it's hard for them to get away from that. And pharmacotherapy can can help with that. You know, there's several, you know, nicotine patches, Wellbutrin, and uh, other medications that are available. And uh, also having the group therapy or the, mm -hmm. the support is all, or the accountability mm -hmm. has also been shown to help. So if you want to quit smoking, get help. You, I mean, it does help to it get does. help. Okay. And that's the best way, okay. in my opinion. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on then to prostate cancer. Uh, we, you know, our topic is the good news about these cancers. So the good news about prostate cancer is what? Well, the prostate cancer is detectable early okay. with the screening modalities and uh, as far as recommendations for screening, it, it would depend on the, the, the man, but uh, in general, American Cancer Society recommends uh, men start getting, becoming, getting screened at age 50, okay. uh, younger for higher risk patients, and we can talk a little bit about that okay. if you'd like. But, uh, with, and the screening is usually with a, a serum or a blood test, a mm -hmm. PSA, and also with a rectal examination. Okay. So with, when we say that it's detectable early, um, I'm assuming from that being detectable early it also means that the treatments that you can begin at an early stage right. have a good, good result. Exactly. Okay. You're exactly right. Because we know that, but when a screening uh, initially was introduced, uh, that uh, the rates of uh, diagnosis went up mm -hmm. and then fell back down. And uh, most of those patients who were detected were detected early. Mm -hmm. And about one in six men will develop breast cancer. I mean, not breast cancer, but prostate cancer a lifetime. Okay. So yes, a high statistic. That's very high. But having said that. Uh, only about 3% of uh, men diagnosed with prostate cancer will die of their disease, but still detecting it early because because not all prostate cancer is the same. Okay. Because there are some patients that are higher risk. We know that uh, African American men, okay. uh, that their disease acts a little different, a little more aggressive. Okay. Uh, and it usually occurs earlier okay. in African American men. And it's, uh, it, I would recommend just looking at all the guidelines that uh, those men start at age 45 screening. Okay. Um, also, the men who have a first degree relative are at increased risk. And a so first degree relative first degree, is? Like a, uh, a father, brother, okay. first degree relative. Okay. Um, uh, 
also uh, there are uh, certain genetic mutations, uh, BRCA1 that is, is a genetic mutation that's frequently mis mentioned in breast cancer. Uh, that's an increased risk factor for prostate cancer too. That's not something we routinely go looking for, right. but if a person knows that they have a history, then their, their screening should start earlier. Okay. All right. Okay, well that's good news about prostate cancer. It's detectable and there are good screenings to detect it early. Exactly. And when it is detected early, the treatments are effective. But we should also probably mention maybe some pre uh, prevention okay. too in Great. prostate cancer because there are some uh, some things that I know people probably may see in the news. I know vitamin D has kind of been a hot topic for prostate okay. cancer uh, lately. and. Uh, and there's vitamins and selenium and a lot of things that people will uh, look at and, and, and wonder about. But um, you know, I know the the association it should be mentioned. The association between vitamin D and prostate cancer is not really clear. Okay. Because we know that patients who have low vitamin D levels seem like they have a higher risk for prostate cancer. But on the flip side, it seems like uh, very high vitamin D levels in, in patients are associated with aggressive disease. So we don't really understand that a lot. But but there are other things that can be associated with uh, um, prostate cancer that are preventable. Okay. And, and one of the, one is uh, you know uh, being obese and also uh, having a low vegetable diet. Okay. Those things are, have been loosely associated with prostate cancer. But it kind of goes along with just about anything in medicine. You know, good exercise, good diet uh, leads to a healthy lifestyle. Okay, so there's been some some indication that being uh, obese and having a poor diet increases your chance for prostate Particularly cancer. a low vegetable diet. Low vegetable diet. Okay, that's something we can do then. I like the that's prevention right. tips. That's great. And another question I have about prostate cancer. I know that um, as men age, it's not uncommon to have an enlarged prostate. Mm -hmm. So my question there would be, is there any link between just an enlarged prostate and prostate cancer? No, there's okay. not. And that's something called benign prostatic okay. hypertrophy or BPH. And just by the name, you can kind of make you feel a little bit better yeah. about it, benign. But no, and but for some patients, they can have an inflamed prostate or something called prostatitis. Mm -hmm. And some men have chronic prostatitis. Uh, that can be uh, linked with certain bacterial infections and what have you, but that is an increase. That does increase the risk of, uh, of prostate cancer, but it's not the same as BPH. Okay. All so right. BPH, no. Okay, but so really the message here for prostate cancer is comply with the screening recommendations. Okay. I agree. Okay. All right. Well, great. Well, then let's move on then to breast cancer. The good news about breast cancer. Um, um, what would what would the good news about breast cancer be? Well, breast cancer affects one in eight women. Okay, so, very uh, common. Very common. And the bottom line for it is there is a very effective screening modalities. I know we've talked about lung and we've talked about prostate, mm -hmm. but breast is probably one of the more successful screening modalities we have in the form of clinical breast exam, mm -hmm. uh, yearly by your physician, and also mammogram, mm -hmm. particularly digital uh, to view ma uh, mammogram. Mm -hmm. And uh, because most breast cancers are detected early. It's very rare to have a patient who comes to see us that has breast cancer that has spread. Okay. And the treatment when it is detected early is also very, very effective. effective. Do you do you know Dr. Baker what the percentages is on that for detection? It, it seems like I read somewhere not too long ago the survival rate when it's detected uh, at a point where it hadn't spread was something like in the 90s or like 98 percent or something. Does that sound right to well, you? Or well, yeah, it's hard to lump a, a, a just breast cancer in and say, well, you know, this, if it hasn't this, spread, if it hasn't spread, because <laughs> there are so many predictors nowadays that are that we could get into and spend okay. a lot of time talking about. Okay. You know, how many lymph nodes do they have? Okay. Uh, what is the receptor status on the tumor? What how big is the tumor? Mm -hmm. But like, but over 90% of patients that uh, present with uh, breast cancer are are not metastatic, which is good, meaning that they they are potentially curable. Okay. And that's why screening is so important. Okay. Catch it early, Catch and it there's early. a very very good survival rate. Very for good survival okay. rate. So there's so many good treatments available for breast cancer, and there's there are new ones coming out all the time. And the best screening you said is a clinical breast exam by your physician and a screening mammogram. Screening mammogram. Okay. All right. Well, beginning at age 40. Okay. All right. Beginning at age 40. Um, is that uh, for all women or just for women who don't have 
a, like a family history of breast cancer or? Um, well, uh, it's a, a pro probably about 10 or 15 percent of our patients with breast cancer have a, a positive family history. Okay. And uh, but that's those are kind of a different uh, okay. subset of patients. Okay. We're talking about uh, just the general, general population. General population is 40. And uh, that then you kind of open up a whole other topic okay. with uh, other patients who are, are higher risk. Okay. Why are they higher risk? How many first degree relatives? Because that kind of leads us down another track okay. because if a patient uh, is at high risk, mm -hmm. then that kind of puts them at a, changes them to, well, maybe there's something else we can do as a prevention. Okay. Uh, and one thing that you could do even is uh, th there is actually a, a, a formula available, it's called the GAL model, okay. G-A-I-L, and, and you can calculate a woman's risk of uh, breast cancer with this model and if she has an increased risk based on this model then one thing that could be offered to her is a drug called tamoxifen. Okay. We, we actually use as therapy for breast cancer but it can also be used in prevention of okay. breast cancer okay. and it was shown in a trial called the P1 trial, prevention trial, to reduce the risk of breast cancer by 50 percent in high-risk women. So okay. that's very, that's a, you know, now that we kind of change gears from uh, screening to, to prevention. prevention. So everybody likes prevention. If anybody's watching this and they're uh, maybe have a mother or a sister or first degree relative who mm -hmm. has breast cancer and they're interested in learning more about that tamoxifen or whatever, what should that woman do? Is that a a visit to her regular physician, mm -hmm. or, or what should she do? Well, it, it is a, a visit to your regular physician, okay. uh, and nowadays it's either the uh, screening mammograms are usually performed by family physician, mm -hmm. general internist, but a lot of times, uh, a lot of our patients seems uh, the OBGYNs are, are doing the mammogram. And the OBGYN could talk about the tamoxifen. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Or it, even if even if uh, the OBGYN is not unsure, then you know we would be glad to see that okay. patient. Okay. Even if they don't have a diagnosis of, of breast cancer. But they would be able to help them evaluate that Gale model. The Gale that you're model. Talking about. Okay. Right. All right. I wonder if there may be even some resources on the website about that Gale model. We might have to we might have to look into that. <laughs> Maybe you could Google that on if, if you're interested in learning more about the Gale model mm -hmm. and to learn more about that. All right, well, um, I want to, before we move in to see if we have any questions, I want to talk about some screening programs that we're offering at Baptist um, coming, coming right up and some that are available at all times, you know, 365 days a year almost, that will help with some of these things we've been talking about for lung cancer. We have a screening program called Test Your Lungs, and it is done through our respiratory therapy department. It's a very inexpensive screening. It's twenty dollars, and um, they give you results right there. So if you're a smoker or you're maybe concerned about exposure to secondhand smoke, that would be a, a good screening for you to work with one of our respiratory therapists to get an idea of the general health of your lungs. If there's uh, something going on they would be able to get you started on the right path there so that's twenty dollars it's called test your lungs and then next month in September Baptist is offering free prostate screenings uh, let me check my notes for the dates for that those screens are available on September 15th and September 17th uh, between 5 and 7 p.m. and again those are free now the number to call for both of those screens is the same number. It's our Baptist Health Line, 601-948-6262. Or if you live outside the Jackson area, there's an 800 number. It's 800-948-6262. And you can call that number to sign up for either of those screenings. And if you do, please tell them that you heard about it on the webcast. And for breast cancer, We've got a lot of programs coming up that we're going to start right uh, beginning next month. Our September webcast, we hope you'll tune in for that next month, is going to be, uh, we're, our guest speaker is going to be Donna Lustig, who is the manager of our Baptist Breast Health Center. And she's going to talk about a lot about mam mammography, particularly um, if you've never had a mammogram, what you can expect. We want to dispel any myths about that and make you comfortable with, with what happens during a mammogram because we really want to encourage those screening mammograms. So be sure and uh, tune in for next month's webcast and then we'll have a lot more going on in October. So there's a lot to talk about there. 
and I'm going to check for any questions that you might have posted for Dr. Baker and if we don't have any questions we'll wrap up with just one final question for you Dr. Baker any questions okay all right no questions we're doing great I guess we're answering everybody's questions so my final question to you before we wrap up we've talked about three cancers we've just talked about lung and prostate and breast but obviously there are more kinds of cancers than mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. what should a person do overall in general to prevent just generally lead a healthy lifestyle that will reduce their risk for cancer in general. Right. Well, I think the probably the best way to, to say that is what other screening, what other cancers can be screened mm -hmm. for. Okay. And uh, cervical cancer is uh, a, a, a big one. Uh, in the 1950s, 60,000 people uh, a year died of cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, only a few thousand at most mm -hmm. die. And uh, it's recommended that a, a woman get a pap smear yearly when she becomes sexually active mm -hmm. or beginning at age 21. Mm -hmm. uh, also, colon cancer screening, colonoscopy uh, being the, the main uh, screening modality for colon cancer. Okay. Beginning at patients for, for anyone who age 50 or older. Okay. Uh, beginning, beginning earlier, depending on if a person has a first degree relative. And also, nowadays, particularly, the skin exam. Because okay. in the South, I think most of us are all high risk, right. and it's always important uh, to have your physician do a thorough skin exam mm -hmm. at least once a year. I, and, and in my opinion, any lesion that looks suspicious needs a biopsy, okay. and uh, or at least a close observation. Okay. So those three great screening tips right there: the Pap smears, the colonoscopies, and the good skin screening. That's great. What about, you mentioned diet and exercise as it relates to prostate cancer. Are there any other sort of lifestyle things that everyone should do to reduce risk for cancer other, other, otherwise? Well, we talked about stopping smoking. Right. And, you know, even alcohol intake has been associated with uh, certain types of breast okay. cancer, particularly estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, but limiting alcohol intake okay. or, uh, um, you know, Obesity has been associated with several different risk, uh, several different types of cancer. Okay. So, uh, diet and exercise, period, limiting alcohol intake, uh, stopping smoking, all those sorts of things. For the sure. things that we hear the, the about, the things that you hear, <laughs> and even the we associate them. I think a lot of times with a healthy heart, but it's encouraging to know that those same behaviors that help your heart can also reduce your risk exactly. for cancers. Okay, exactly. that's great. All right, well, we'll wrap up then today. Thank you for tuning in, and thank you so much, Dr. Baker, for helping us with thank these. You. And um, do join us next month. Our webcast next month is going to be on Wednesday, September 9th, same time, 12.15. Again, it's going to be Donna Lustig talking about your mammogram and what to expect. We hope you will join us. Thanks for tuning in.